let's talk about the future. What kind of mm -hmm. stuff, you, you mentioned about the importance of the biosphere, but what are the crises that are ahead of us? That, uh, this, that, that a chaotic dynamics view allows us to predict well, what, and be what concerned What really I about. saw coming out of it, with, leaving aside the ecological, wasn't a crisis, it was stagnation. Because what we got out of the, the crisis was caused by a rising level of private debt. Okay? Now you reach a peak level where the willingness to take on debt collapses. And so you go to a period where debt is rising all the time. So credit, which is the annual change in debt, and that's credit is part of aggregate demand and aggregate income. So credit goes from positive to negative, and that causes a slump. So, that, what, what, uh, so can you describe why that causes a slump? Okay. So when you, we, credit goes to negative. Yeah. If you ask Paul Krugman, he'll tell you credit plays no role in aggregate demand. Okay. Uh, give me a second. Yeah. Uh, credit plays no role in, in aggregate, aggregate demand. demand. So the vision, credit. the vision that the neoclassicals have for the banking system is what they call loanable funds. Is Paul Krugman, by the way, the uh, the knight at the front of the army that is the neoclassical economist? Yeah, fundamentally. Okay. Sure. Okay. Um, uh, he he's he's politically reasonable, which makes him more dangerous than those that aren't. He's politically, yeah. You know, there's quite a lot of people that would disagree with that characterization of Paul Krugman as he's politically you reasonable. Should see, you should see the people behind the alternatives. Him. <laughs> okay. Okay. okay, okay, fair enough. Okay, I'm, that's, that's not a negative or positive statement. That's just he can be feisty as well. Oh, he can, he can. Yeah. But he's like the human face of neoclassical economics. Sure. And, it doesn't deserve having a human human face. It's sure. anti-human theory. Right. But tell he's me what you really face. think. I got you. All right. Well, yeah. so, yeah, uh, so, but the, the cr credit does not have any effect on ag aggregate demand, demand in their and, model. And you're saying that's not the case at it's all. It's absolutely crucial to aggregate demand. So what they model is, again, the example of you lending to me or vice versa. If I lend money to you, I can spend less, you can spend more. Okay, so credit credit is the change in debt. So if, there's, if I lend money to you, then there's a level of private debt rises. Okay, so there's an increase in credit but that increase in credit comes at an expense of my spending power. So you can spend what I've lent you, but I can't spend what I've lent you. So credit cancels out. But when you look at, that's learnable funds. But in the real world, and the Bank of England has said this is the real world and the textbooks are wrong, categorically in 2014, um, when the bank lends, it adds to its asset side and says, you owe us more money, and it adds to its liability side and says, here's the money in your bank account. Now you spend that money. So what happens when you do your, your sums, credit is part of aggregate demand and aggregate income. Mm -hmm. And that's something I first solved in 2019, I think. 2000 is only, only recently proved it mathematically. So what that means is credit can, is a component of aggregate demand and credit is also very volatile. It's like consumption demand never goes negative. Investment demand never goes negative, but credit can go from positive to negative. And when you take a look at the long run of uh, American history after the Second World War, there was no period uh, until 2007 where credit was negative. It was a positive component of GDP, a positive number. And therefore, when you do it as a percentage of GDP, it was a positive percentage of GDP. It peaked at 16% of GDP in 2006. 2007, it fell to minus 5% in 2008, 2009. So you had a 20% of GDP turnaround in aggregate demand. Now, when you plot that against unemployment, the correlation of credit to unemployment uh, across the period from about 1990 to 2010 is about minus 0.9, okay? enormous negative correlation. Now, according to the neoclassicals, it could be close to zero. Mm -hmm. okay. Empirically, it's bleedingly obvious it's not, and it applies to every country in the world that had a financial crisis at that period. So it's it's bleedingly obvious in the data, and they ignore it because credit's not part of their model. And you're saying it's causation, not Causa just causal. It is causal. Today, we said there is extremely high inflation. Mm. What... Uh, does inflation, what role does inflation play in this picture? Is a little bit of inflation good? We talked yeah. about money creation um, in, at the beginning. 
what's a little bit of inflation good or bad, a lot of inflation good or bad, how concerned are you about? A little bit is good for a simple reason that, like, again, it's taken me a while to get my head around around this. But if you think about how people say, what are the functions of money? They say money, it's a unit of count, account, so you're measuring. It's a means of exchange, okay? And it's a store of value, okay? Now, yes, okay, it has those three roles, but the last one is contradictory to the previous two. Because, and this is where we see this with the Bitcoin phenomenon, if you want to hang on to money as a store of value, then if prices are falling, the value of money is rising. And it's actually in your interests as a store of value to hang on to it and not spend it. Okay, So that contradicts its role as a means of exchange. Now, if you have money which depreciates, and this was actually tried in the in the Austrian town of Wargel during the second before during the Great Depression. If you have money that depreciates, then if you don't use it, you lose it fundamentally. So it has a high rate of circulation. So there's a a monetary theorist called Silvio Gazelle, and he wrote this proposal that money should depreciate, and he was a, a ridiculed and opposed and derided. But Keynes said he was a great intellect, and the mayor of town of Wargall in, in Austria during the Great Depression was facing an unemployment rate of you know, 25% pretty much. Germany had the worst experience in the Great Depression in the world, as, as, as bad as America, slightly worse than America. And so he thought, how can I stimulate demand here? So he produced a script which could only be used for buying goods and services in Wargall and, uh, and could be used to pay your, your local rates but it was depreciated by putting a stamp on the money if you didn't use it. So what happened was people would pay their rates. They they needed to pay the rates using this money, so the the script, so they used the script. And because it depreciated, you'd use it rapidly. So people were using that money, this alternative to the Austrian shilling, and the economic activity in town took off and unemployment fell to zero. And it was an absolute miracle, and everybody loved a Wargle experiment, and the Austrian Central Bank sued them for establishing an alternative form of money and shut it down. Unemployment went back up to 25% again, and Austria voted, you know, what, 99 point, what was it, 99.6% for the Nazis, something crazy number like that when, yeah. when Hitler marched in. Yeah. So the Wargle experiment showed that a, a depreciating currency led to a high rate of circulation. But of course, we're not talking Weimar Republic levels of inflation. So when you get that much inflation, and that's normally caused by, as the as the as the Weimar inflation was caused by, the reparation terms imposed on Germany, fundamentally by France at the Treaty of Versailles, they pay, paid a large part of that with just basically printing the notes. And you went into this crazy period of hyperinflation. So hyperinflation almost always occurs when there's a massive destruction of physical resources and the monetary authority tries to paper literally over it. And then you get hyperinflation, that's total social breakdown. So a moderate level of inflation inspires the means of exchange usage of money, but undermines the store of value usage of money. And and that dilemma is why we have this antagonistic attitude towards inflation. Yeah, I mean, you're describing as a tension, but it's nevertheless is like money is a store of value and a means of exchange. And I don't, you know, to push back, it's not necessarily that there's a tension. It's just that depending on the dynamics of this uh, beautiful, beautiful economic system of ours, it's used as one more than the other. Mm. If there's inflation, you're using it more for the uh, means of exchange. Mm. It's deflation, you're using more for store value. But that doesn't, I don't see that as a tension. That's just a, uh, how much you use it for those different, like. But it ends up saying that overall, for a level of effective commerce, a bit of inflation is a good thing because that's depreciating the money slightly and encourage its use. Yeah, but so the argument that uh, so Bitcoin folks use or gold standard the folks, yeah, the hot, yeah. Well, the, the hot, again, hodl is not an argument. Uh, is that having an inflation of zero is actually achieving that balance? Yeah. Right? So, like the yeah, but if they're actually in favor of negative. They they wanted to appreciate rapidly, you know, and there's a particularly negative inflation. The the, the the you know value of the value of the money rising relative to commodities. That's what they want. That's the hodl philosophy. 
Well, that's more of like an investment. I don't know if that. Yeah, but that's see, more of investment philosophy than the fundamental principles of why they believe yeah. in, in cryptocurrency in yeah. the enforced scarcity as a model. The, the concern there is that when you print money, the public pol uh, policy is detached from the actual um, from value. Yeah, well, you get. I mean, this is this is where again it matters to get money creation right, because the government's not the only money creator. Banks are as well, private banks, and. And if we obsess too much about limiting government money creation, what we end up getting, if there is money creation going on, it's private banks doing it, and you get an increase in private debt, and fundamentally, private debt and its collapse, a uh, collapse of credit when it stops growing, that's the fundamental cause of financial crises. So, yeah, but the question is, what's the, what's the the cause for the the collapse of the? Uh, well, I think th this is like the Austrian thinking leaves out the debt deflation. Mm -hmm. And that's like, I think one of the most important papers ever written was by Irving Fisher called The Debt Deflation Theory of Great Depressions. Mm -hmm. Fisher was somebody who accepted the neoclassical vision. He wrote the pre um, efficiency market hypothesis, efficiency market hypothesis. He had a, his, his, his own PhD called The Theory of Interest. Mm -hmm. And in that, he argued effectively for a supply and demand analysis of the of the um, financial system. And he argued for equilibrium. He, he said, when you're working with a a like a commodity market, then the sale and the uh, tr the transaction and the, and the exchange occur at the same point in time. Mm -hmm. When you're working with a financial market, then the exchange occurs through time. <clears throat> so he he said he assumed that debts are repaid. All debts are repaid. And he assumed that uh, equilibrium through time was an essential part of his assumption. This is, and then the Great Depression comes along. And he has become a major shareholder in rank Xerox because he invented the Rolodex. Mm -hmm. He's a tinkerer. And so he had taken out shares on margin, and he was worth about 100 million in modern terms when the Great Depression hit. And 90% of that was share market valuation. He'd taken out margin debt, just like everybody else. And with margin debt, you could put down $100,000 and buy a million dollars worth of shares. So you got this huge leverage into debt. Now, that when the financial crisis hit, the level of margin debt in America had risen from half a percent of GDP in 1920 to 13% of GDP in 1929. It then fell to zero again. That's why the stock market crash in 29 was so devastating, that scale of, of margin lending. And everyone was being wiped out. They were selling Rolls Royces for 20 quid. You know, that, you literally have photographs showing people doing that because a margin call comes in. You've got to liquidate everything. Okay, so he said the, the danger is, is, is of a debt deflation is what we have to avoid. Okay, and that means you don't want too much private debt to accumulate and you don't want falling prices because the falling prices will amplify the impact of being insolvent to begin with. And that's what we saw in the Great Depression. It's partially what we saw in 2007, but we didn't have anything like the level of, of margin debt. Margin debt was reduced from 90% to 50% ratio after the Great Depression. Um, so there were limits on how bad it was in 2007. But the danger is still the period of deflation amplifies your debts, okay? And he's, he, he, I call it Fisher's paradox. He didn't write those terms himself, but he wrote a line saying, the more debtors pay, the more they owe, okay? And this is because you're liquidating to try to meet your own debts. When you liquidate, the price level falls. You will end up having a lower level of monetary debt, but a higher level of debt when you deflate it using the price level. So the biggest danger in capitalism is the debt deflation, far more dangerous than inflation. And the cause of debt deflation is? Too much lending, too much bank lending, too much private money creation. And if you take a look at the 1920s, Calvin Coolidge explained the boom of the 1920s on his surplus. He said, my government running a surplus of 1% of GDP, pretty much from 1922 through to 1930, is the foundation of our stability. It should be continued. What he didn't look at was that over that same time period, on average, Americans were borrowing 5% of GDP per year from the private banks. 
So you had a housing bubble at the beginning of the 1920s, which Richard Vague covers beautifully in the uh, brief history of doom. And then you had this huge rise in margin debt as well, gigantic increase in margin debt. So all this borrowed money was being spent into the economy, and this is where credit becomes part of aggregate demand. Mm -hmm. And it's both not just for goods and services, it's also for shares and houses and so on. So a huge valuation effect. But then when the margin debt turned around, when people would not take out margin debt anymore, the demand for margin debt disappeared, and then it was a, a, you know what we call badly a positive feedback loop. It's actually an amplifying feedback loop, right. and that caused a collapse. So what elements of that do you see today that we need to fix, and how do we fix it? We have to regard the level of private debt as a target of economic policy just as much as the rate of inflation or the rate of unemployment. How do we, what, what is the moderate amount of private debt that's good? I would say something of the, anywhere between 30 and 70% of GDP. What is, is it, it currently? Uh, in America, it's 170%. Nice. Of GDP. Of GDP. Oh, that's nice. I've got, we, we'll have to look after we talk, but I can show you the, the data in this. And it's, it, it is just this huge increase in private debt yeah. that caused, first of all, caused the boom, but then financing the credit causes ultimately causes the slump. And so if we remove the rate level at which debt can reach and we stop speculative lending and base have a lending for both you know, innovation, invest, investment, and essential consumption items, we won't have the slump on the other side. We can, we can get rid of financial instability. We can't stop financial cycles, but we can stop financial breakdown.